thank you for joining me here on sjs classes let's continue our discussions on the paper malayalam literature in english translation so far i have discussed five poets o n v kurup balachandran chullikar vishnu narayan nambudri b sugata kumari and k sachidanandan in the previous video lesson we discussed kadamanate ramakrishnan and his poem shanta please do watch the part 1 of my discussions on this poet as well as this poem in this video lesson we will read and try to interpret the remaining stanzas of the poem shanta from the previous stanzas we understood that there are two characters in this poem one is the speaker and the other is the speaker's wife who is called shanta so the speaker returns home and he asks uh, his wife shanta to come and sit beside him after doing a series of things he asks her to change her dripping clothes to comb her tresses to line her eyes and her arching eyebrows and also to mark anjanam on her forehead with a studied bandan the speaker asks her to sit beside him and to fill up the emptiness Uh, that he is experiencing around uh, him with a few extremely pleasant words then he goes on to describe uh, the kind of eyes that she has the kind of smell that she has and he asks her to awaken him awaken his soul awaken his heart mind and soul by caressing his chest he knows that Uh, they do not have evenings now they do not have enough time to be together and therefore he calls these moments as magical moments but these moments have been obtained forcibly he also notices how tired and how soot laden shanda is probably after a hard day's work at the hearth he sees the unkempt hair of shanta which is speckled with ash he sees the smudge on her face the smudge that has come from the soot she sees he sees the three inch long scar on her sweating back and also the torn portions of her blouse and the speaker says that i see it all he also says in spite of all this let us uh, forget all that and uh, snatch a few moments for ourselves and he visually describes the sights that he sees around him he imaginatively describes it he imaginatively describes the sky to have uh, deers deers with a crescent on the antlers deers carrying the crescent moon on their horns that is what the speaker means or the poet means and also he sees the spectacle of a thousand kantari flowers blooming on the high mountain ranges so he imaginatively describes the nature that he sees around him the sights that the speaker sees around him and finally he asks the crescent deer the crescent deer to make a ring around his compound to make a protective ring around his wife shanta that is where we uh, ended the previous video lesson we will move on to the next stanza what no water for bath not no no water even to drink couldn't bathe the children because of this where are they have they gone to sleep without a bath dirt and grim and all in this summer are they the ones who fret in their sleep poor children so as i said yesterday this poem is about the coming back of a man and since this is written in the backdrop of the indian emergency of 1975 we can understand why there are a lot of changes that has come over his village and the environment too has changed the village from which he once left has completely changed and Uh, he is experiencing or is conveying that experience of change to us readers in this particular stanza the speaker realizes that the picture has changed in his village in the front and from this stanza we understand that the village is experiencing a scarcity of water the speaker says what 
no water for bath, no water even to drink. Couldn't bathe the children because of this. Where are they? Have they gone to sleep without a bath? Dirt and grim. Grim is something which makes you unclean. Just like dirt. Dirt and grim and all in this summer. So the speaker is quite surprised at the fact that the children couldn't sleep before they went to sleep. Are they the ones who fret in their sleep? Fret means to become irritated, probably because of their unclean body. We know how irritated we will be, how we will even lose sleep if you, if you don't have that clean feeling, if you don't have that fresh feeling. Are they the ones who fret in their sleep? Poor children. The country mango trees, standing weary by the road, ask after the children leave, whither or traveller, to the heart of this village, afflicted by torpor and fatigue? Why do you go to this ill-fated village with not even a cross cloth for shade? So in this particular stanza, the speaker for, continues to you know, describe the present plight of the village. He says, the country mango trees standing weary by the road. Weary means fatigued or tired, probably because of the extreme heat. So this fatigued and tired uh, mango trees that are there by the road asks uh, this man uh, once the children have left. Whither or traveller, where are you going? To what place are you going? To the heart of this village afflicted by torpor and fatigue. So are you going to this village that is afflicted? Means seriously affected. Seriously affected by torpor. Torpor means inactivity or insensibility by torpor and fatigue. Fatigue means tiredness. So are you going to this place which is seriously affected by inactivity or insensibility and tiredness? Why do you go to this ill-fated village? So the mango tree uh, reiterates that question, that point of view of that particular tree. Why do you go to this ill-fated village? A village that is marked by bad death fortune. Why do you go to this ill-fated village with not even a cross cloth for shade? This probably indicates the absence of trees and the extreme heat that the villagers and the village as such is experiencing. So there is not even a cross cloth for shade that is the present plight of the village. Let's listen to the reply of the speaker. The, the speaker says, I say, he says this to the country mango trees. I say, I have my Shanta like a spring in the desert waiting for me at that ill-fated village. So this is his reply to the mango trees who ask him the question, with the old traveler, why are you going to this afflicted, uh, this place afflicted by torpor and fatigue? The speaker says, I have my Shanta and he makes a comparison there. Just like you have a spring in the desert. Spring as you know is a continuous source of water, a natural flow of water. And when you find that in a desert, it's extremely pleasing, satisfying. So he says, I have my Shanta. In spite of the place being afflicted by torpor and fatigue, there is a reason why he visits that place. He returns to that place because he has his wife. He has his Shanta. I have my Shanta like a spring in the desert waiting for me at that ill-fated village. Can't you hear her scold her stubborn children? So, mango trees, can't you hear her scold her stubborn children? Stubborn, as you know, is, means unwilling to respond, staunch. Can't you hear her scold her stubborn children as she waits impatiently for my return? Let your father come home, you mischief monger. So, this is something which the uh, character Shanta tells to her children. Let your father come home, you mischief mongers. Mischief mongers means someone who trades mischief, someone who sells mischief. So he, she calls her children as someone who trades mischief. Very mischievous children, that is what she intends to convey. I'll make sure that you get a good beating from him. So this is what probably all wives does. They always you know, warn their children of the kind of punishment that they will get from their father. Always the father is the figure who is ready to punish their children for their mischief, mischievous doings. So in this uh, poem too, the father is, the, is that figure who 
uh, will punish the children uh, if they do something bad or if they are very mischievous. So the wife says, Shanda says, I'll make sure that you get a good beating from him. And the poet says, sorry, the speaker says, my children who have gone to bed without even a good beating. It doesn't mean that the poet or the speaker wasn't able to give, uh, wasn't able to beat the children or they did not get good beating. It simply means that the children couldn't see their father. They went to bed even before he arrived. So then in the next stanza he continues to you know, describe the present uh, situation of the village. Has our well too gone dry? All wells have dried up. Ponds, streams, rivers, all are dry. So probably the first line is a question that is being asked by the speaker to his wife and the remaining lines are the response that he gets. He asks, has our well too gone dry? The response is, all wells have dried up. Ponds, streams, rivers, all are dry. Then he describes one particular sight that he sees on his way back home. At the twisted head of the ferry boat, ferry boat is a boat that transport, transports people across a water body. You know what a ferry is. At the twisted head of the ferry boat, pushed ashore on the ford. So the ferry boat is pushed ashore on the ford. Ford is that shallow area of a river. Pushed ashore on the ford, sits the ferryman idle. So the ferryman sitting idle means he doesn't have any job. So nobody is crossing the river. Or um, as we understand from the context, the river has become dry. So he doesn't have a job right now. Sits the ferryman idle, his head between his knees. He stares unblinkingly at the dry sand of the river bank. So uh, from the context we understand that the river has, go has dried up and you can actually see the river bed and the ferryman is staring at this dry sand on the river bank he is in no mood for pleasantries pleasantry means casual remarks or mild jokes and the man the ferryman is in no mood for that i have seen all that on my way home unable to creep and spread themselves the cucumber vines that you have been watering have withered and tumbled down so he saw the ferryman sitting idly and staring at the dry sand on the river bank and as he approaches his house, his home, he sees that the cucumber vines that his wife has been taking care of have withered and tumbled down. Even the corn fields are wrenched off their ten turns. So what has happened to cucumber vines has happened to the corn fields as well. They have been wrenched off their ten turners means pulled off their ten turners. They have dried up. That is what the speaker means. And whatever happened to all those frogs that rang in the rains with their croaks, perhaps they are dead in their holes in the field base. So frogs, you know how they croak are once you have the rain. Now you can't hear any frogs and the poet, the speaker guesses that they might have died. They might have perished in their holes. So all these lines describe the extremely pathetic condition of the village. These two I have seen on my way home. The racket of men and women with pots and buckets crowding around the dry spring at Kanyarapara. So it's not just the uh, ferry boat and the ferry man the cucumber vines and the cornfields that he has seen he has seen he has also seen these sites these two i have seen on my way home the racket of men and women a group of men and women making loud noise that is what the racket of men and women means the racket of men and women with pots and buckets crowding around the dry spring at kanyarapara so what why are they making loud noises let's understand Hurling abuses at each other, so they are abusing each other. For what? Each blaming the other for the death of water. So this is why they are making a lot of noise. They are blaming each other. They are blaming each other for the death, for the shortage of water. Abuses punctuated with cuffs. Abuses punctuated means interrupted periodically. So you have abuses which are stopped periodically with coughs. People are coughing. Probably that shows their dry thought. The lack of water. Abuses punctuated with coughs. Coughs punctuated with abuses. Choking on coughs and abuses. 
so this is why there is a lot of noise at that particular place people are abusing each other people are coughing because they have very dry throats because they they haven't got enough water to drink to slump down on the ground so they seem as if they are about to fall down as if they have attained a posture as if they are go soon going to fall down to slump down on the ground with their hands on their heads look the wind sources too have gone dry the trees are still so it's not just the scarcity of water that they are experiencing they don't even have wind over there look the wind sources too have gone dry the trees are still their roots gone deep in search of water so even the trees are finding it hard to find water and the speaker says the roots must have lost their winding way underground and perished so in their search for water they might have you know perished they might have uh, passed away how long can they survive on salty tears so the only water these plants these trees get are salty water this salty water might mean you know the tears of the villagers perhaps that is the only water that they receive uh, as of now look at the moss that have come out of their hills look at their underbelly are there no signs of rain clouds there so the speaker is talking about the rain moths that emerge from their pupil tunnels after a heavy rain or when rain is imminent you know earlier people used to uh, prophesy about rain by looking at these rain moths so the speaker says look at the uh, moths that have come out of their hills look at their underbelly are there no signs of rain clouds there come shanda let me put my ear to your heart let me breathe in your fragrance so finally he understands that his village is experiencing a, a terrible a, his village is going through terrible times and he wants some sort of consolation some sort of solace so he approaches his wife again he says come shanda let me put my ear to your heart let me breathe in your fragrance let me taste your alluring smile alluring means highly attractive let us you and me my woman melt together so let us be one let us be united let us divide our sorrows and rustle up from them a lotus flower on whose petals to dance so let us divide our sorrows and rustle up from them rustle up means to make from them a lotus flower on whose petals to dance dance to glory sweat to glory until we melt and rise again as a rainbow dream as a cloud burst as a rain so let us unite now let us be together now and let us unite to form a rainbow dream a cloud burst as a rain to seep again into the pores of this our earth so let us become one so that later we will come back to this earth as rain so that there will be water here on this here in this village come to me like an evergreen fullness a lake tremulous with love so shanda come to me like a lake tremulous with love like a lake that is shivering quivering with love that is full of love come to me as grief as force as truth as my spirit's music so approach me in all these forms complete me fulfill me that is what the speaker requests of shanda come shanda as the music of this cosmic force so uh, the speaker requests shanda to take many forms so as to probably bring back the dead earth back to life again and that is why perhaps he says come as this grief as force as truth as my spirit's music as the music of this cosmic force the twilight rain the twilight hour like a broken torso creeping towards its severe severed head the sides of the earth with lips twisted in agony i cannot cast my eyes on anything how distorted everything appears noble ideas come furtively to ruin my peace of mind so it's the twilight hour that that time of the day immediately following sunset like a broken torso creeping towards its severed head the torso is that part of the body excluding your head neck and limbs so 
like a broken torso creeping towards its severed head, the sides of the earth with lips twisted in agony. I cannot cast my eyes on anything, probably because of the intense heat or, <clears throat> or the extremely hot condition that is prevailing in the village, the poet is not able to cast his eyes on anything. <clears throat> How distorted everything appears. Now, everything is out of shape. Everything is formless. And the speaker says, Noble ideas come furtively. Great ideas come to you in a secret manner. And why does it come now? To ruin my peace of mind. To ruin the peace of mind that he has now. Or whatever is left of it. So it's not exactly an ideal peace of mind that he has now. But he has something of it now. Where is what is here to be seen and heard? So this is the actual situation of the village. What is here to be seen and heard? There is nothing in this village. The wretched eyes roving over the sights, the very unhappy eyes, you know, wandering aimlessly over the few sights that are there in the village. The evil ears chasing after the sounds. So all that is left in this village is wretched eyes and evil ears. The tongue tied down to varieties in taste the nose savoring all kinds of smell, the skin that desiccates sensations of touch, desiccates means lacks, the skin that lacks sensations of touch, the mind that takes in both what is needed and what is not, and above all, hovering over the mind, that bird that makes us feel everything, everything. So what uh, remains in that particular place is wretched eyes, evil ears, tongue tied down to food, nose savoring all kinds of smell, skin that lacks sensibility or sensitivity, a mind that takes in what is needed and what is not. So you have leftovers in that particular place. You don't have the right kind of mixture in, mixture in that place. You have everything, the good and the bad. And that's the, the speaker says all these because he is experiencing terrible loss. He is at loss once he returned to his village. The senses unkind. Cast a look at the sky. It's ugly, pork-marked face. So earlier we saw how he beautifully uh, give us a, gave us a visual description of the sight that he see, saw around him. But as of now he says, cast a look at the sky. It's ugly. As of now, the sky is ugly. Pork-marked face. A face marked by scars. Well, the face that you have once you are done with the disease, smallpox or even acne or other skin disease. So the sky is as of now very ugly, pork marked face with its blind blinking eyes. No laughter here or happy tidings. So as of now there is no laughter or happy events occurring in this place. Only the barking of limping dogs. So you can hear only the barking of the limping disabled dogs. With that, we come to the end of this video lesson. There are a few more stanzas which remain in this particular poem. I will discuss those stanzas in the next video lesson. Thank you so much for watching.